Hi, everybody. I think we'll get started now, if you don't mind. I know it's uh, right after lunch, so people will trickle in. But we only have an hour, and there's a lot to cover. So with that, um, today we're going to be presenting a, a project called Bibflow and uh, results to date. Your presenters are me. Uh, oops. Sorry. I've got two computers here. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm the university librarian at University of California Davis campus on the PI on the project. And joining me today are Carl Stamer, who's the Director of Digital Scholarship at UC Davis, and he is the project manager, uh, a longtime digital humanist, and a longtime advocate for linked data and the potential it brings to digital scholarship. And finally, uh, Eric Miller is the co-founder and president of Zephira, who is our development partner on this project and has been working with the Library of Congress and other organizations on BibFrame uh, for quite a few years now. So the three of us are going to be presenting this project, and um, we have basically three parts. Uh, Eric is going to talk a little bit about BibFrame and the potential of linked data for this community. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what the drivers for this particular project are and what we're trying to accomplish with it. And then um, Carl will do the majority of the presenting, talking about um, specifically what we're doing in the project, what we found to date, and demonstrating some of the results so far. So um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Eric. And I think your slides are queued up, so yep. just take it away. Got it? Uh, that yep. Do you have the Perfect. I've got it. You got it. Okay. A little magic. I do. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. I'm not sure where everyone's coming in from, but it's always nice to cover bases. Um, I'm going to start a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about linked data and, and bib frame, but I'm going to do it first by sort of talking a little bit about our perspectives. Um, so. Uh, many of us that are looking at this from the Zavira perspective, we've been fortunate enough to uh, be part of a lot of the uh, low-level underlying standards and technology that are part of the web. So a good chunk of all the poorly named acronyms um, that underpin the web, we've either been directly responsible for or have had a hand in, um, <coughs> including the naming, sorry. Um, we've also been very fortunate to work with uh, Library of Congress, OCLC, and other national libraries uh, related to um, strategy and design of linked data implementation, um, the underlying vocabularies, uh, large-scale implementation projects, um, large-scale deployment projects, and um, really sort of ground-up thought exercises and designs related to next-generation libraries. So we're looking at this from a lot of different perspectives on the technology, um, the social, cultural, you know, and market opportunities. Um, some of the shared observations with this you know, just in this perspective is, you know, a library is far more than its underlying collection. Um, linked data is linked first and data second. I'll talk a little bit about what that means going forward. Um, the web of data is here now and being used very successfully for a variety of different um, uh, commercial and collaborative and sharing efforts outside of the library communities. And libraries can dramatically participate in this with just a couple of key changes. So uh, I like to sort of roll this back. And when we start thinking about linked data, bib frame, and libraries, um, Chuck Gibson, who's the director and CEO of the Worthington Public Library, I mean, I, I like the way he's really sort of characterized sort of the problem related to libraries and the web in general, which is just in short, when my community searches the web for something that we have, we better show up as an option. Um, this is an issue that basically is, is challenging public libraries in particular, but libraries in general. Um, when people go and search the web for stuff, whatever that might be, we literally just don't show up as an option. And, you know, in part, this is because we're not speaking in the way the web understands. We have a tremendous amount of valuable, cultural, you know, you know fantastic information, but we're encoding this, sharing this, um, and locking this behind legacies and closed technologies. And in fact, this is what, um, from our perspective, uh, BibFrame basically is addressing head on. So the Library of Congress uh, several years ago um, launched an initiative about um, a new bibliographic framework, building on the foundation of MARC, but embracing um, the, the fabric of the web. Um, BibFrame is that initiative. Uh, it's from, again, from our perspective and from the web interpretation of that perspective, a way of, of defining controlled web points, 
um, for more effectively sharing bibliographic information, collaborating and navigating among this. And its design, very intentionally, is um, a, enabling simple, replicable patterns that, in fact, can allow us to describe a wide range of, of assets and make the simple things simple and the complex things possible. So from a vocabulary and modeling perspective, there are a lot of atomic replicable patterns that can be used in a lot of different ways to describe very traditional assets, but to very complicated assets and sort of everywhere in between. And if we look at this from what this also might further enable, working in a particular context of, of cultural heritage, museums, archives, we have a tremendous amount of sort of descriptive information and descriptive standards that we as various different communities have come together and used to arrange our assets. Part of what we're looking at in terms of linked data and particular bib frame is a way of sort of taking that and projecting that into the way the web understands. And recognizing this continuum, this very important continuum between descriptive standards for organizing assets to discovery standards for basically using the web as a platform for driving people back into the assets that we have. So there's a lot of really um, uh, very important work that's happening at the discovery layer, the search engines around schema.org, uh, Facebook re-architecting around Open Graph, and in fact, lots of different initiatives really about using the web to help people find what they're looking for. Part of what we see as an opportunity here is, is using BibFrame as a way of projecting our valuable assets into a way in which we can then um, uh, project into more effective discovery layers. Now, the ones the web understands, but also going forward, you know, this is a very exciting, dynamic space and allowing us to be well positioned to project into whatever basically comes forward. So I want to take a, and be very concrete about this. This is a way in which we can take very existing, you know, our existing MARC records, model them as bib frame, and use this as a way of sort of seeing how that data starts to connect together. So this is a, um, a small collection of, of assets that um, the University of California Davis and George Washington University sort of were using to experiment around Jane Austen, taking 70 MARC records and materializing, you know, the people, the places, the concepts, you know, all the different kinds of things that are inside of that MARC record in a way that allows us to sort of link together. We can navigate in on the work and start to see basically what we might traditionally think about the work, taking just the top one. Again, this is looking at this not as a new discovery system, but the raw data that's behind it. Um, we can start to extract the creators and the contributors, the genres, the subjects, the fact that this particular work is part of a collection. We can choose any one of these things, in particular navigating on the person, Jane Austen, and see all the things that she created, all the areas in which she's a focus of, which means the areas which she's basically, you know, you know in the context of subjects take one of those subjects, one of those concepts, see how it connects to the various authority services, and, and keep pivoting around how people and places and concepts and work start to interconnect. This is a simple way of taking our existing data and exposing it to the web. And then this is, in fact, ways in which applications can, in fact, consume that. So what you were looking at wasn't a human interface necessarily to mark data, but in fact a machine interface. And part of what we do is very similar on the web in terms of making the things that humans understand, but it's this strip behind the system that machines pick up on and being able to take that machine readable data and start to do interesting things with it, such as populate the things you see on the right hand side of the consumer web search engines. The Jane Austen on the right hand side of that is generated not from a single web page, but from aggregating data from lots of different trustworthy sources, lots of different credible sources, and creating a comprehensive overview of this. Part of what we're doing in linked data and bib frame is surfacing our credible assets in the library community so that other applications can take advantage of these and start to basically merge it and drive more people, in fact, back to the library where that credible information is available. So in the context of those particular exercises, and very quickly that overview of the potential of linked data, bib frame, and libraries, rewinding back to the specific observations, again, library is more than its collection. 
Linked data is about linking first and the data second. Being able to connect things together is how the web works. The value of anything on the web is proportionate to the number of things that link to it, not link from it. We have a tremendous amount of linked data in our library. We're just not exposing it in the way the web understands. But Mark, via BibFrame, and the work that the Library of Congress is doing in this, really allows us to, to project into the web a really powerful library substrate of credible information that the web wants to consume and that our patrons are using as a way of finding things. It's incredibly valuable outside of just our catalog. We have a tremendous amount of local information that in fact actually exposed in these global standards provides new control points in which we can start connecting to. And one of the last bits of information that's worth mentioning here is that not all of our library data needs to be linked. You know, there's a lot of discussion in terms of linked data and the potential, but in the context of libraries and library systems, trying to understand where the critical parts of our assets can be used more effectively outside of our libraries or more effectively across system boundaries and those that in fact can be local to specific applications is in part what we're trying to explore in BibFrame. So in that context I'm going to hand it back over to Mackenzie and talk about some of the drivers and goals behind this project and how we've taken these standards and general technologies and start to exploring in a very practical way what that looks like in terms of a university. Eric. So now I'm going to take you back in time a little bit because, um, let's see if I get this to work. Once upon a time, there was a project that I worked on at MIT called Simile with um, Eric and in his CSAIL W3C days. Um, and we were really <coughs> trying to figure out, you know, this was a long time ago, back around 2003 for six, seven years. What, what could the semantic web do for libraries? So. This project was really looking at and produced a lot of tools to do things like create linked data, merge linked data, visualize linked data, navigate linked data, blah, 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 and so what, right? There are other projects working on this now. The LD4L project is a great example of, you know, what can you do if the world is linked data, right? And Eric just spent 10 minutes telling you about some of the potential that we have in the linked data space. But I was, at the time, running a large library IT operation that looked like this. It's a Rube Goldberg machine, right? You know, the interdependencies, the historical legacy systems, millions and millions of mark records, people who only knew how to use particular tools, this huge ecosystem that we're part of. So the problem that I had is, how do you get from what he just showed you when you're starting here? So. We asked ourselves two questions. With the complex system of interdependencies that we're all living with, how could the library community imagine adopting BibFrame? The library community, not any one library, but all of us. And you know, the Library of Congress is, is just one player in a very large ecosystem. And what might adoption of BibFrame mean to a typical research library and its technical <coughs> services operations, the operations that we're spending literally millions of dollars on every year? So those were the key questions that drove the Bib Flow project. We're focusing on academic library technical services operations, the processes that we do all day every day, acquisitions, licensing, cataloging, and so on. And we're exploring the impact of the new standards on those operations and those workflows. Okay. So we have to ask ourselves a lot of really hard questions. How does existing software systems and workflows inhibit adoption of new standards. You know, I have Ex Libris, right? That is my ILS. It does not deal with linked data. So what a lot of people were doing is taking their data out of these legacy systems and dropping them into customer pilot systems, but you can't really transform a library operation with that kind of model. How effective is simple conversion? If we just take Mark and dump it into BibFrame, you know, what, what is that bias? How can we, um, what could we imagine a next generation library management system doing if it was linked data native? How might these workflows work in a wider library ecosystem where we have organizations like OCLC and the Library of Congress and vendors and Yankee? What investments should, I am a university librarian, I have to decide, you know, when am I going to take the leap? What am I going to invest in? And we're talking about very large investments that we make every year. 
is incremental adoption feasible? Is there some way we could inch our way into this, or does it have to be a big, giant, join hands and le leap off the cliff kind of thing? And could libraries adopt this technology at different times? You know, if, if I'm ready to go now, but the other nine UC campuses aren't, would that work? So this is just one of many, many questions that we're kind of trying to tackle with this project, which is why we need a community of people like you to help us figure out what the questions are and what the answers might be. So we're looking kind of at the whole ecosystem. We're looking at organizations that are key in our environment. And so we have the Library of Congress, but we also have, you know, vendors, um, OCLC, Yankee, many, many others. Um, you'll see a picture in a little while of just one example of that kind of interdependency. We're also looking at the range of metadata that we deal with in the real world every day. <coughs> it's not just Mark. There's a lot of other metadata, too. And one of the things I remember talking to Sally about when BibFrame was being cooked up is, could we come up with an umbrella that would let us integrate all of that metadata into one standard? not just mark. Workflows, you know, we, you'll hear more about this soon too, but we have many, many workflows in the library and probably, you know, 50 to 100 staff who live or die by those workflows. Those are not gonna change overnight just because there's a new standard out there. And then many, many tools, tools that are available today and then tools that are being developed by ours and other projects like LD4L. So we're looking at all of that, but from the context of this fundamental question of what is a research library going to do, what is the roadmap for us to be able to adopt this kind of technology at scale? So with that, I think we're going to talk about what we've actually done so far, um, and I'll let Carl take it over here, and then we'll come back to what's next. All right, so as Mackenzie said, the real deliverable of this project is that roadmap. And that's our goal, is to figure out how do we get there, and to make some suggestions that are really community-driven. In order to do that, though, we needed to test some things to figure out, okay, what would work and what wouldn't. And this is the slide that McKenzie alluded to. So this is the modeling of the Rube Goldberg machine, where we took the Davis Library, we went through, and all of these are different uh, locally software systems that belong to us at the UC Davis Library. See, so these are Davis ones. We've got, that's the, you know, the university as a whole. We've got the University of California system, because we're part of a larger system. We've got our external vendor systems. There's some 40 odd different software systems out there that in one way or another touch our bibliographic data, right? The work that we do in the library. So it is a very complex universe. In its worst case scenario, we'd have to build a little tool for every single one of those. Right? And in some ways, that's kind of what's happening now without a roadmap. There's this sort of ad hoc, you know, okay, I need to do this, do that. That's an equation for disaster, because inevitably you're going to miss something. So what we really, the, the whole point is to figure, to test how do we change this out as effectively as possible. One of the things that was on Mackenzie's questions, I think we've already answered, which is it has to be an incremental rollout. There's no universe in which we're just going to flip every service over. You know, on June 23rd, 2016, the entire library universe is going to go link data. It's just, for a variety of reasons, that's not an optimal solution here. Uh, so what we have to do is figure out this sort of phased-in approach. Um, one of, what we did to start the project, part that's sort of already been completed, is we went through each one of those, I'll go back for a second, each one of those software systems as Mackenzie alluded to, as multiple people whose jobs are devoted towards working in that system. So this gets exponentially large when we talk actual bodies. Each one of those has a particular workflow that they go through. So the first thing that we did is we started documenting those workflows. And in a very detailed way, saying, you know, this person gets a book, they get, go to this piece of software, they type these things in, then they send it there. So we had a real sense of what our ground truth baseline data set was. We're at, what we're at now is a sort of development and testing phase we want to get to. And to have a system that we could test in, what we're doing is using Qualiole as our system. I think most people here are probably familiar with Qualiole, just real quickly, people who aren't. It's a open source, very community driven project to replace essentially an ILS system. It's quite consciously not called an ILS and there's, there's good reasons for that. It's designed to be very modular in a way that an ILS, which is you know an integrated system isn't, and so it, it has a much more object-oriented and, and modular design. 
the part that we're specifically concerned about here for this project is the describe function, and I'll get to that in a moment. But Ole provided us a way that we could fork all the code. And so it gave us a ready-made code base for a package that handled all the various functions in the library. And it also had, talks to other Rice accounting functions. So it really provided a good test bed. So we're doing a lot of development in Olay. We're trying to do that with an eye towards the community as a whole. And the idea that some of the work that we do could ultimately move out of its own separate fork and become part of Olay. But our real, I want to emphasize that the real purpose of this project isn't to develop another software platform. It's to give us something that's a testable environment so that we can produce our roadmap. So uh, this is in Olay right now. This is the, if you want to describe something, it's sort of what we'd expect. You go to their Mark editor and you see the things that you'd expect, all your Mark fields and you know, you, it's very field based because Mark is very field based because the card that Mark was based on was very field based. Right, and so you get this monster form and you say, okay, I, I want to put this data in that field and that's the way it works. The data store behind that, the system architecture for the current version of Olay is patently not linked data oriented. It's based on that model. I don't say that as a criticism. There's good reason for that, which is people needed to implement it in the Mark world and that's how it lives. So the rough shot here, this is a very high view, um, is that it has this doc store here, which is what stores actually all of our bibliographic data. It's got another database, and I actually don't know now, that it's probably the da same database engine serving it, but it holds a lot of data that's just its own business data, right? With it, what it needs to manage itself. But it maintains this doc store. At one point, that was a Jackrabbit system. Now it's uh, SQL driven. And that's where your stuff lives. And then it has the various modules that communicate back and forth there. One of the things it has that's really nice is a very robust API system for talking in and out for a, putting your different front ends and discovery layers on. So what we are doing here is replacing for our bibliographic data for this project, we're not going to the SQL, we're going to a native triple store for that. And for right now, we're not touching, the, uh, the other modules are still communicating through the old channel. And what we're doing is just using the persistent ID to bridge the gap between those two. And I'll talk later about where we think that could go in the future. But for now, that's where we've drawn the line. We're just dealing with our bibliographic data. And so we're developing towards that. So with that, I think this is my movie slide. Uh, where we're at, we've got a very early version of this that we've just completed, I say completed, you know, I mean, it's an early version and there's a lot more work to do, but what we're gonna do is show where it's at now. And because I don't have the same level of stress tolerance as a lot of other presenters here, I'm, we, I'm not doing this live. I just recorded a video of me working in the system and cataloging something, and that's what I'm gonna be showing you. And, it, and I wanna preface that by saying that I'm a, uh, a data guy and a semantic web guy, not a cataloger. And I also am notorious at making typos. And I consciously sort of actually didn't do this video 10 times so that I had it perfect, perfectly off my script because it's gonna betray the ways in which actually working in linked data helps with the fact that I have a lot of finger errors and reduces the problematics with that. So we're gonna watch it in all its error-filled glory. And, uh, um, and I'm just gonna kind of narrate and talk through it a little bit. There's one point where I do wanna pause. But so basically we go to the describe function we go into what still says Mark Editor, but instead now it takes us to a totally different interface that is based on the uh, scribe. And I'm just gonna have to talk fast. So we get to choose which linked data things we go to. This is the Zephyr-based scribe. We've ported it into Ole. You, the first thing you do is choose what kind of thing you're gonna catalog. Based on that, it loads a profile for that type of object. So the screen changes depending on what we're clicking. You can see a different set of fields show up here. And so we've predefined, like this is this set of bib frame for that, for that, and it loads the appropriate fields for that. Now here I'm gonna do is I'm gonna catalog a version of Shakespeare's Henry IV, the critical edition. And what happens here is I still get to type in what's my local title. This is just, you know, the normal stuff. Right? So this part, I'm not doing anything linked data, I'm just typing it in. But you'll see here when I get to author is where the magic is gonna happen. As I start typing, it starts to autofill based on lookups from the various linked data sources that we've indicated we wanna go to. And ultimately, it lets me say, okay, that's the guy I want. It's William Shakespeare, that's, that's my guy. 
and it adds that. As we keep going down, I'm going to do the same thing for my editor. Now, the key thing here is that we're still seeing Shakespeare William. What the computer is seeing is, is seeing the URI a persistent identifier for William Shakespeare. In its brain, that's what it knows. It's only displaying the literal string for my benefit as a human user. And that's a big key to the whole system of how we get to link to those authorities and make sure that our records can talk one to the other. So you basically, you move down the system and it's pretty robust already in terms of talking to various uh, controlled vocabularies that are there. It's uh, I'm going to wait till we get to the next one. I'm, can I speed this up a little bit? I wouldn't. You wouldn't? Oh, <laughs> good call. Dang it. <laughs> I just did. Um, somebody try to speed that up for me. Play it. See, Eric, can you get on there? I, I can help. Can you, you drive? Okay. Um, see, this is why I didn't go live, and now I'm dead on the water already. <laughs> there we go. Okay, let me just go. Here, I think I got it now. All right. Um, I'm going to click down here. I, well, look at that. I ended up right where I was. Oh, okay. Perfect. So here I'm still a string literal. Um, there are some things here that we're already seeing like with, that will continue to change. So right now what's happening is you can see we're, we've got our nice lookup on different fields, but I still have to sort of start over with every one, right? We think going through this, and I, at the end I'm going to talk more about this, that there are ways where when I put right up atop that I was dealing with Shakespeare and Henry IV, that using linked data, it could go in and already grab data and pre-populate, make suggestions to me about what go in the other fields. So we can chain these things so that it dr gets dramatically more efficient. And that's an end game goal here. It's not just to realize the benefits of linked data, it's to say, can we actually build an interface? We believe we can, just a little bit we've been in here, that actually makes everything faster, more efficient, and better all at the same time. So uh, here, this part I do want to mention specifically, when we get down to this world here, we're in now stuff that isn't very Mark-like at all, right? These are our sort of more <coughs> Ferber-like, bib frame uh, sections that let us put relationships into things. That was my mistake. I decided this went somewhere else. And so here I'm saying, what this is, is this addition of? And it's going to, as I keep typing, it's going to find me a Henry IV. It shows up, oh, okay, there is a Henry IV part one. That is what this is an addition of. That's the point where there, if we played with this interface and had that first, right, we could start to pre-populate a lot of the data that's there. The uh, publishers here, the, I show this one because it brings up a particular function, which is, I will say this linked data, we haven't connected these dots yet. But this has a function which we can add a new provider. So we can maintain locally. We're trying to look up to the local authorities or to the remote authorities via linked data and sort of grab that name from there. In the case that we can't, we create a local version of that. We haven't worked through the details of that, but what we imagine is that ultimately we're going to have to have an interface, which is then a sort of new kind of work, where we've minted a local URI for this new thing that we're only using locally. And we have discussion, well, should we just put the string literal then in the data that we're publishing for that moment? But ultimately, we have to connect those dots, right? Eventually, that entity will show up in an authority list. And then we're going to have to make note that this thing that we've entered in locally is that thing and do a sort of same as reference. Here's now, though, the part that I really want to talk about. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to put in an ISBN. Um, when I get to my ISBN here, We've done some initial playing with this. I truly believe that this is possible, which is that we would type in the ISBN, which is I'm going to do in a second. And based on that ISBN, we could look up. Here's where we could really chain things. We can take that ISBN. I can go to LC. I can go to Library of Congress. I can start to chain all of these things together and actually pre-populate about 90% of this. In theory, I could pre-populate all the way up to all I have to do is my local variants. Well, my local title is this or put some other things, like it has an autograph in it here, right? That type of stuff. The, le the level of efficiency there is extreme. And we are, as this project, going to experiment with actually using our phones. We're going to do the poor man's version, just scan the barcode with our phone, extract the ISBN, go do the lookup, chain the whole scenario. Uh, here I'm going to export it and then show you. So we've gone through, and again, what we've been seeing is the human cataloger, or the strings, all the way along. But what the computer sees 
is the URIs, and that's what's reflected in our bib frame. This is we have it serialized as RDF XML, and you can see that all of those things are their perfect, good, nice, authority-controlled URI, and that's the key to all of the stuff that Eric was talking about. How we can connect our records to everybody else's records. So that's our, um, you know, produces our final end game here. As I said, this is very, very extremely beta. This was our first pass at that user interface, um, and it will improve in several ways. So first of all, ultimately, we can see bringing more than just the bibliographic data into this universe, right? This is a, a discussion we have. People say, well, why would you want to do that? Well, for example, and this is a true story, on Friday, I got an email on my desk from a sociology faculty member who is doing a study and wants to look at circulation data around a set of particular texts in our library, right? Now there's some privacy issues with that because we can't have human names attached to that CERC data. But if he wants to know that, other people want to know that as well. I could make a compelling argument why CERC data belongs in the triple store, right? Because that data is now attached to this record, this literal thing. So we will ultimately be thinking about how we could move other things into that universe. Uh, what we will definitely do here is continue, so we'll complete our sort of initial phase, our beta version of the software. That's where we're in right now, we're not completed, but we're working towards completion of the sort of initial linked data version. Once we have that testing environment in place, the next phase for the project is to do local testing and enhancement. What we mean by local testing is we are going to actually sit a whole crew of our catalogers down in front of the new system and say, do your work. Right, you have your work that you would normally do in this world now, do it this way. And then tell us, was it better, was it worse, what worked, what didn't work. Based on that feedback, we will hone the user interface and try to hone the system. Then once we finish that phase, we will go to external testing and enhancement. We have a first round of that already <coughs> planned that's UC internal for all the UC libraries where we're gonna then run virtual sessions and have people at remote other UC campuses work in the system, tell us what they liked, what they didn't like. Based on that, we will do another round of fixing and tweaking, and then we will go to external testing. And we've already started to form relationships with NLM in particular and some other institutions externally who then want to work and help with this testing. We're open, we would love to hear from more. People that want to sit at that phase and bang on it. And we're doing that not just to enhance the product itself, right? So the goal here isn't just test and fix the product, it's test and what do we learn, right, from this situation. So, and that goes back finally into the roadmap. And so I'll give anecdotally, like one thing we've learned already is that if, when we went back, and everyone can just imagine, I don't wanna click back to it, but that interface where we're doing the cataloging, people are immensely concerned, and this was a shocker to me actually, they're tremendously concerned with what the labels on each of those fields are. I mean, it really matters to people. Like, to me, I was like, well, that's a no-brainer. I can change that label in 10 seconds, right? We make it whatever it is. But it actually didn't occur to me that that was going to turn into an hour and a half discussion that where I was going to have to talk back people out of some panic when they first saw it, right? And that, that's a huge point of learning, actually, for the roadmap and for the, ultimately, if we continue to develop the product, there's a solution for that, which is make that a very easily externally configurable thing, and people that want it, a certain set of labels can have theirs and others can. So there's a solution, but noting that, documenting it, and working that tells us a lot about how the community is going to have to move forward in terms of the final roadmap. So for us, success on this will be actually the fact that we're able to, what we've learned in all of these stages, produce a successful roadmap as in a literal document where we can communicate that well to the community at large, that rests on this phase, right? The, if we don't have community participation in part of the process, then whatever roadmap we produce will suffer to the extent that we don't have that, right? The wider that participation and we can get people involved in the project at that level, the better chance that we actually produce a roadmap that will work for the wider community. And it's something Mackenzie said. We don't think everybody has to, and I sort of alluded to it earlier, it's not necessary that every library 
you know, flip over at the same time. There's naturally going to be a progression. But if the people who are progressing that way aren't moving in a direction that the, uh, that everybody else in the community wants to go, then it's a failure, right? We, we have to solve the business and sociological problems, you know, really before we tackle the technology problems. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mackenzie to kind of wrap us up. So we've deliberately kept this presentation pretty short and to the point because I'm hoping that we can have a little bit of a discussion during the Q&A period because we're sort of determined that we at UC Davis will, you know, eat our own dog food and really try to make this work in a production environment, very typical kind of environment, um, and try to understand what, what would get in the way. And what we haven't started to do yet, and we'll begin soon, is looking at other workflows beyond just cataloging. Um, what? I drank your water. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. Uh, so other workflows, like circulation, interlibrary loan, all of those kind of things. Um, and to Eric's point, not everything has to be linked data. But what beyond the bibliographic data, what does need to be linked data in order to create a technical infrastructure in a library that works? Uh, because we don't want to have lots of parallel systems that we have to maintain over time, right? So, um, so we're sort of getting beyond the point where we do the, the discovery layer that Eric showed and we just take our MARC data out of our ALS and throw it over the wall to the linked data system. We want to make sure that we're thinking about all the kinds of data, all those interdependencies, and starting to reach out to some of the organizations in the community that we all depend on, like OCLC. Now, OCLC has been very involved in the linked data world too, but there hasn't really been a forum for lots of research libraries to talk to the organizations like OCLC that are doing good work in this area. So that's kind of the next phase of this, is, is bringing the community together. We can do a roadmap for my institution, but that wouldn't necessarily you know, have the effect that we need community-wide. So, um, so we do want to produce a roadmap that would be of benefit to other institutions, and that's the question I'm coming to. The, the partners that we're officially talking to are the Library of Congress, OCLC, Kowali, uh, Ole, and NISO. Um, but there are a lot of other projects working in this space. I mentioned ld for l so that's one. But, um, you know, I think, Eric, you interact with lots of organizations. There, there are a lot more, right. Yeah, so, so really, as a community, how can we begin to knit some of this stuff back together? And in particular, if you're in a library organization, what, what could we produce from this project other than code in Ole that would help you understand what you need to do when in order to join the party and get the benefit of linked data, assuming that you're convinced that there is benefit, which I am. So um, I think I'm going to stop with that and thank our funders, IMLS, who made this project possible. Um, and then ask you if you can give us any advice. Well, certainly we're open for questions. But what would you like to see that we could do in the next year that would really help you understand what your choices are and what investments you need to make? And with that, I will stop and we'll take questions. All right, well, we're going to close now. We're around, but thank you all for coming. I appreciate your time.